Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. Welcome to this comprehensive video guide on Microsoft's Active Directory Group Policies. Whether you're a seasoned IT professional or just starting to delve into the world of network administration, this video is tailored to enhance your understanding and mastery of group policies. Now, we only have a small amount of time in this first video, but we'll kick it off by exploring the infrastructure of group policies, that framework for central management and configuration in a Windows environment. Understanding this backbone is crucial for anyone looking to streamline their network management tasks. Next, we're gonna dive into technology and protocols that make group policy so powerful. You'll gain the insight into the intricate workings behind these policies, enabling you to leverage them effectively in your organization. And the core of this video will be a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the fundamentals of how group policies are constructed, stored, and deployed. This section is designed to provide you practical, hands-on knowledge from creating a policy to deploying it to a domain controller and ultimately applying it to a client. If you've been looking for that group policy video that helps you get some framework and fundamentals down, jump in, here we go. What is meant when we say group policy? Group policy is describing a technology that allows your admin to control how the user functions in the domain. It also allows them to control how the computer will function in the domain. Group policy clients will check in to the domain controller for a refresh or an update to any policies that may have changed within 90 to 128 minutes. That's the default. Now, group policy structure is modeled after Active Directory structure. It's gonna have both physical components and logical components. Some of the logical components that are actually going to be inside the Active Directory database are things like display name, GPO path, GPO version number, the GPO status, access control list information. The physical components are gonna be files and folders that are gonna be wrapped into a special folder with a GUID name, which will make it a one-of-a-kind folder, and inside will be the files needed to implement this group policy. These logical and physical components that make up a GPU are going to be stored on a domain controller. If you were to look at these two components, the information that's stored in a group policy container, Active Directory, and then the group policy templates, which are files and folders. It would be hard to tell as you look at these two components separately that they have anything to do with group policies. Now, those logical components of group policy are actually stored in Active Directory partition called the domain partition. Those logical components are stored in that domain partition in Active Directory. If you remember, Active Directory is broken into partitions, configuration partition, schema, domain, and there's an optional partition you can have in Active Directory called application. Now the files that make up group policy, they're going to be stored in a special folder called a sysvol folder. And then we're going to turn around, take that folder and share it to the network with a share name of, you guessed it, sysvol. And yes, all of this is on a domain controller. Now, if it's been a while since you've refreshed on Active Directory and you're struggling with the idea of partitions in Active Directory, I encourage you to take a look at a video called Active Directory Troubleshooting. And I focus on a utility called dcdiag.exe. In that, I really go into those partitions. So if you want a refresher, go to YouTube and take a look. The information for group policies that's stored in the Active Directory domain partition is the glue that ensures all references, paths, network locations, Active Directory objects are accounted for in the group policy deployment. 
Now in the sysvol folder, we're going to put all those templates and files and folders all wrapped up in a folder with a GUID name. So it makes it a one of a kind set of files and folders unique to that GPO. Now these physical components of GPOs are called GPT, Group Policy Templates. And they're not just a single file or folder, but rather sometimes a suite of folders and files that are used to store and maintain settings and anything else needed to establish that GPO. Now here's a newly created GPT that's being saved on the domain controller sysvol folder. I've opened up the GUID folder and inside is a folder called machine. That's going to store the computer configuration information for this GPO. There's also another folder called user and that's going to store the user configuration information for that GPO. And the GPT INI tracks the GPO version number and anytime there are changes or modifications to this GPO. Now, if this GPO is going to edit the registry, when we open up the GUID folder and look inside, we're going to see a file called registry.pol. That's going to indicate that this is going to modify the registry. This is a part of GPOs that are called administrative templates, and they will always modify the registry. Now, one thing for sure, I want all my GPOs that I create on a domain controller to be replicated to every domain controller. And that's going to be the job of the replication services on Active Directory. This diagram is a great template for understanding group policies. I've got my administrative workstation and it's outlined as computer one and the administrator on the administrative workstation launches the tool that you see here. And this is gonna be my group policies management console. This management console communicates a specific protocol that allows it to talk to Active Directory, the domain controller, so that as I design group policies for an OU or group policies for the domain or group policies for the site, the results of what I do in the group policy management console are going to be applied in the domain controller Active Directory and then a series of folders and files on the sysvol. All of that is going to be saved on that domain controller. So down below in computer two, which represents my domain controller, I've got my Active Directory data store, and I've got my share and our sysvol folder that's going to save the files that represent each and every group policy that I create. And what are my clients over here going to do? They're all over there designed by default to go to the domain controller and say, do I have a GPO? Is there a GPO for my OU? Is there a GPO for my domain? Bring that GPO down. They're just going to do that by default. Now, GPOs that are designed to impact the computer, the minute they boot up, they communicate to the domain controller, request some LDAP information for a GPO that's related to the computer. That is applied then during boot. For a user, specific GPO that's impacting a user, that GPO is going to be applied when they log on. So when a user logs on, then the user-specific GPO is going to apply to that user when they log on. So having work in a school system, high school students used to log on to their client workstation, and the minute they logged on, they would unplug the network cable. They had learned from TikTok or whatever that the group policies were eventually coming down on that workstation and they were attempting to circumvent those group policies coming down. But the minute they plug that cable back in, at some point every 90 to 120 minutes, their workstation is gonna go back to the domain controller and say, please give me my group policies. So they will come down whether they like it or not. One of the most powerful utilities on the client side for group policies is utility GP update. It's and one of the most popular switches is the slash force. In other words, we're going to tell that workstation, go to the domain controller and push those group policies down. If you're in help desk, you've probably learned this utility like day four after you were hired and you've used it ever since. So let's look at an example so that we can see how this manual tool on the client really is a great help desk tool 
it also demonstrates how group policies works on the client. So I've opened up my users and groups MMC and I can see that the guest account is disabled. I have a GPO that disables every guest account on every computer on the domain. And you can see it's got the down arrow, it's disabled. So I'm going to open up the guest account and I'm going to enable it and turn it back on. Now in 90 to 120 minutes, this should automatically go to the domain controller, refresh and disable that account. But I can use GP update and say force that policy, bring that policy back from the domain control onto the workstation. So here we see the computer policy update has been completed, user policy has been updated. This is like the ABCs of help desk in relation to group policies. Now let's go up to our user. Let's go back just for a second, go back to user and we'll refresh and you can see it's disabled again. We looked at the server side, we looked at the group policy management console, how it interacts with Active Directory, creates information in Active Directory store, and then we have the files that are saved on the sysfall folder. Now let's move to the client and look at the components that make the client work with GPOs. Take a look on the right hand side of this slide and we're looking at the computer number three, domain member, this is the client. We call some of the components on the client as client side extensions. Now client side extensions are really two basic fundamental things. One, a DLL in the Windows System 32 folder and a registry edit in the registry. So when we talk about client side extensions, you're talking about a DLL and a registry setting. This next slide is very busy, but again, move to the right. You'll see the computer number three. This is our client. And over here, as we get to the far right hand side, we actually see a service that's running on every GPO client. That includes, remember, domain controllers. We put GPOs on domain controllers, member servers, all of our workstations and laptops, they all run a service called Group Policy Client Service. And that is the engine on the client side that's going to work with those client side extensions. And then we're also going to find another series of files that are going to extend the reach of what we can do with GPOs. Now let's take a look at the components on each and every client. Remember that's domain controller, member servers, workstations, laptops, whatever. All of them are clients. They're going to have three components. One, the group policy client service. And that is the engine for group policy on the client side. We also have the client side extensions. And those are a series of DLLs. And you can see a sample of them here in this slide. There's many more. And each of those DLLs is responsible for things like categories of group policies folder redirection, disk quota, quality of service packet scheduler. Every one of these DLLs is registered in the registry and you can use this PowerShell script here and look at the registry settings for each and every one of these DLLs. It looks something like this. I'm going to use a PowerShell script to actually bring up a table of all those registry settings for each and every one of those client side extensions. I'll have it in the notes and you can see here I've got a nice table of the registry setting, the GUID, and that particular group policy that's tied to that DLL and what category of GPOs that particular DLL is responsible for. You can see at the very top, it's responsible for wireless group policies. The next one below is group policy environment. Now the last component on the client side is a series of ADMX and ADML files found in the Windows Policy Definitions folder. Long list in Windows 11, I think it's 219 of these files that are administrative templates that are kept updated by the Microsoft Update system. Whenever a group policy comes down that needs to edit the registry, we go to these policy definition folder to where the ADMX file is. That ADMX file will help us apply those registry changes to the registry to apply that group policy. So on the client side, we have a service, we have 
client-side extensions, which are DLLs and registry settings. And then last, any time a group policy needs to edit the registry, it's going to go to these ADMX files and use them to help apply those registry settings to that client. This slide is a great diagram of what's taking place. Take a look on the right hand side. We see the client booting up. It's talking to the Active Directory server. The win logon process works right with that group policy client service that initiates communication to the client side extensions, those DLLs, and our system 32. Of course, the registry is involved. And then we can start applying group policies as they come down. We can take advantage of the ADMX files on our client if we need to edit the registry. As all this is happening, if you'll notice in the diagram over on the right hand side, we see the event log is involved so that as we get into troubleshooting these GPOs, we can always go to that event log and look at what the client was doing. Is there something in the event log that can help us troubleshoot our problems? Now it doesn't take a genius look at group policies as an architecture and the components that make it work and realize this is complex. That means you're going to have problems with GPOs. But understanding the underlying technology will help you in troubleshooting why group policies are not working or working in a very bizarre way. How does Microsoft keep all these files on servers and clients updated? All of your critical system files are actually in the Windows backslash WinSS folder. So all your system files, your System32 files are not there. Those are hard links. Everything that's protected by Microsoft is always in the Windows WinSXS folder. So your Windows policy definitions, all those ADMX and ADML files, they're not there. Those are just hard links. They look like they're files. They're just hard links to where they really are. And that's going to be in your WinSXS folder. The reason for that is that the only person that can access those files is the Windows Update service. So they're kept update, they're protected from you and from everybody else, and then we hard link them to the System32 folder, to the Windows Policy Definitions folder, but they're all originally in that protected folder. Now, if I'm blowing your mind with this, don't panic. I've got a great video that I did on repairing the Windows 11 Server 22 protected file system. I go into detail explaining the structure of Windows protecting its critical files and how it takes all of the critical system files, puts it in a single protected folder that only the Windows Update has access to, and then hard links it out to the various directories that you need so that it appears they're there. They're actually not. They're hard links or shortcuts to the original file, which are always in this single protected folder. I'll have a link to this video if you'd like to take a look in the video description. I have my Group Policy Management Console open and I'm at the Group Policy Objects node. And in here is all the group policies that I've created for my domain. I'm going to choose one. But we'll look at my default domain policy and I'm going to edit, bring that down. And under here, I have all the computer configurations and policies that I can deploy. And here's my user configurations. I'm going to drill down into my policies, go into my Windows settings, and I'm going to be looking at this snap-in. It's called security settings. Of all the policies that you can deploy in a Windows 11, Windows 10, there are thousands and thousands of policies that you can deploy. Security policies are the most important policies that you can de deploy using GPOs. This is also true under user configurations. I can open up policies, go to Windows settings. You can see security settings, again, are the most important of all the group policies that you can deploy. In fact, if you look at best practices, the top 20 GPOs that you can deploy in any domain, I don't care what it is, are probably going to be security policies. When it comes to GPOs and security policies and deploying them to clients, and remember that's domain 
controllers, member servers, workstations, laptops, everybody is a GPO client. When we do this, Microsoft is going to handle these specific security policies coming down from GPOs differently. When I create a security policy using GPOs, we know that it's going to save a GUID folder in the Sysvol folder. If I open up those GUID folders and I find an INF file, that's going to tell me right away that GPO is a security policy. Well, let's look at the process of how our client, which is shown here on the slide, how does it handle group policies that are security policies? When WinLogon goes and queries Active Directory for group policies, it's going to detect if there's a policy that's going to impact security, it's going to turn on some special DLLs that are going to handle those INF security policies that are coming down from Active Directory. They are then going to go through a series of security DLLs. They're going to then allow that security policy to edit the local security policy database. That policy database is called secedit.sdb. Once that database is edited, then it applies that security policy to that computer. So notice the slide shows us step one, step two, step three, step four, five, six, and then we have 6A. These are the steps, the process that it's going to follow when it sees a security policy coming down. Now this slide is busy, but I'm going to walk you through it. Notice on the right hand side, we see the group policy, the INF file on the sysvol folder is going to come into the group policy client. It's going to be handled by special security DLLs here in the client interface. It then will be processed down through another series of DLLs that are going to look at the configuration, analyze what this policy is, edit the security policy database down here at the bottom, and then apply those security policies to the local security authority in Windows, the security accounts manager, if that's what it needs to do, the registry, and then impact the user and computer in those changes that this policy is going to do. Now, we can impact security policies on any client through command line tools up there, the cedit.exe tool. We can also use things like the local security policy that can impact the local machine. If I go and search on my local machine, I can type in local security policy and I will get an editor that will allow me to edit that security database on this particular Windows 11 machine and I can impact the security policies of my local machine. I can't impact anyone else. It's local only. But this also gives me that interface to my local security policy database. Now another interesting feature of group policies, I'm going to go to group policy management console, group policy object node, and I'm just going to pick a group policy. We'll choose default and I'm going to go to edit. When we deploy group policies, we can deploy policies and we can deploy preferences, two different things. So let's take a look at what are preferences. And notice I can apply preferences under the computer configuration and I can apply preferences under user configuration. What in the world are group policy preferences? Group policy preferences are a way for an administrator to set policies that are not mandatory. The user can change them. In other words, they may launch a software package and it has a certain look and feel or Windows has a certain look and feel. If it's a group policy preference, they can actually go in there and change it. If it's a group policy, they're most likely not going to be able to change it. So what's the difference? Under policies, enforcement group policy settings are enforced by default and the scope of group policies is huge. It's thousands of group policies. Under preferences, known as GPP, flexible customization, they allow the user to change those settings after they've been applied. They extend beyond the range of many GPOs. Another problem with preferences is they can tattoo the re Windows registry, whereas group policies do not tattoo the Windows registry. 
So group policies and group policy preferences together kind of achieve a balance. User customizable preferences that users can change if they want to. Now one of the big drawbacks to GPP or group policy preferences is the concept of tattooing. If a group policy preference applies some particular setting and later that preference is disabled, the setting remains on the user or the computer. This is sometimes called tattooing. So when we're developing GPOs, we can select GPOs that are preferences. You can see there's a wide range of preferences that can be applied. If you establish policy, those are going to be enforced. Preferences will be set on that PC, but the user can change them. All right, so let's create a preference under computer configuration. I'm going to open up preference, Windows settings, and here is folders. Under the folders, I'm going to go ahead and right mouse click and go new, and we are going to create. Notice I can update, create, replace. I'm going to go ahead and create a folder in the C drive. C colon backslash Mr. V, and we'll make the attributes read only and archive, and we'll go ahead and apply. So this is a preference, and it's going to create in the domain, every computer in the domain is going to get a C colon backslash MRV folder. And let's just go see if that preference is applied. This is one of my computers here. And let's go to the root directory. And here is C drive. You can see there's no Mr. V. Let's do GP update. We'll force the update of group policies on this machine. So those preferences will come down. And we'll just wait until that completes. There it's pulling down the computer policy. Next will be the user policy. And let's go see if preferences were added. And let's see here. Yep, there's MRV right here in the root of C. Now, because it was a preference, if I go back and I say, eh, I changed my mind, delete that preference of creating this directory in the C root of every computer in the domain. What will it happen to that folder that's already created? So here on this particular computer, that preference did come down. Mr. V is in the C root. I'm going to update. That preference is, is now gone. And I'm going to bring the latest root policy down, which no longer makes that directory a preference to that Mr. V folder. We see it's still here. This is what we call tattooing. Even though I've removed that preference, that impact of that GPO is still on that machine. So what are some of the GPPs, preferences, that can actually tattoo your registry? Anytime you make registry settings through preferences, drive mappings, scheduled tasks, shortcuts, INI file modifications, environmental variables, and adding files and folders can all tattoo the registry. And even though you remove that preference, the damage is done. As we open up Group Policy Management Console, who has the rights to create group policies? If we come down to Group Policy Objects node, we can come over to the delegation. Notice we have contents, shows me all the group policies that I've created for this domain. And then under delegation, I can see all the groups that have rights to create GPOs. So this can be totally modified depending on your admin team. Another important feature of the Group Policy Objects node is I can right mouse click on it and I can back up all my group policies. Don't forget to do this. I can manage my backups from this Group Policy Object node. As I open up my Group Policy Objects, I can see a group policy. This is on BitLocker. If I right mouse click, I can back up this group policy anywhere I want on my admin station, on a file server share, even on my domain controller. Another important feature of any group policy is being able to have documentation. So I can right mouse click any group policy and save a report. Document that group policy. Now by default it creates this HTM file that you can open a browser. and I find this pretty kludgy. I'm going to go ahead and save this one. Now I have opened up that HTM file that I just saved for BitLocker and this is the report. It's, a, it's an HTML look and feel. I find it kludgy and difficult and 
awkward. There's a lot of third-party tools that you can save documentation on your group policies that have a more robust backup and recovery system. You can use this built-in tools that are in Group Policy Management Console, but they're very basic. Now, one nice feature about Group Policy Management Console is it's in sync with Active Directory users and computers. So if you add an OU or you make a domain change, it's reflected back into your Group Policy Management Console. Up to this point, we've looked at group policies only from the perspective of Active Directory deployed group policies. We've used the Group Policy Management Console, which is tied directly to Active Directory, to deploy our group policies. I can apply group policies to PCs and workstations that are in a work group environment. They do not have a domain if I use the local group policy editor. So let's go to search and I'm just going to type in group policy. You can see I have an edit group policy and I'm going to launch that shortcut and it's going to launch the local group policy editor. Notice it's local. It is not Group Policy Management Console, but it's the local group policy editor. So I can, in a work group environment where I have individual PCs not in a domain, actually apply group policies. It's not efficient, but you can, if you want to, install local group policies. So when we apply group policies, if there are local group policies, the order in which the client will apply group policies as first, local group policies, if you've used that local group policy editor, then any group policies from the domain that have been applied to the site are second, and then any group policies that have been applied to the domain are third. And notice what is last. The last that is applied are group policies that are applied to an OU, organizational unit, in Active Directory. Now, take a look at what has precedence. On the right-hand side, those policies that are local have the least amount of precedence. Then those that are applied to the site have the next precedent. Domains are second in precedent, and the ones that were applied last have the highest precedent in terms of impact on your PC and user. So OUs are last to be applied and have the highest precedent. So when it comes to which will override the other, OUs having the most authority on the user and the computer. So this concept of precedent makes group policies applied to our organizational units very important in our strategy. We really don't care about local or site or domain as much as OUs. So organizational units are the most important policies that we can apply to users and computers. Now, that does not make group policies applied to domains unimportant. There are definite reasons why we apply group policies to domains, and the same applies to sites. There are specific policies that we want to apply to a site, but the order of precedence is given to the OU. Every client has a local group policy editor. We rarely use it, but you can. For most administration of group policies, we're going to assign them to domains, to sites, and to OUs. OUs are the most important assignment of group policies. So in the world of group policies, we create group policies, then we link them to either a domain, an OU, or a site. We can go back and edit them at any time. We can apply them, which is basically the same thing as linking them and then manage them, maintain good documentation and good backups of our group policy. Also, we never assign group policies to containers in Active Directory. Over here on the left-hand side, I have Active Directory users and computers, and we have containers in Active Directory, and we have OUs in Active Directory. I cannot apply group policies to containers, such as the built-in, the computer, the foreign security principles or user containers in Active Directory. Any OU, I can apply a GPO. Another important concept in Active Directory is enforcement. You'll see I've got it highlighted in red. I've got an OU called BitLocker. Any laptops that leave our premise, I'm going to add that laptop into the BitLocker OU. And I've got a GPO that forces BitLocker on any 
laptop that is in that OU. These laptops may be in other OUs and I want to use the enforced feature so that no matter what policies are being applied in other OUs onto that laptop, the minute it is added to the BitLocker OU, that BitLocker policy is forced onto that hard drive. Nothing is more important in your group policy design as your Active Directory layout and your OU strategy. Because OU play such a critical role in the way group policies can be applied, the more thought goes into your Active Directory design and your OU design, the more effective your group policies can be on your domain. Now on my domain, I have a special OU and it's called No GPOs. And in it, I don't have any GPOs. So if I'm troubleshooting a GPO problem, I can always move a computer into the No GPO OU, which releases it from all GPOs to see does that solve the problem that the poor user or that computer is experienced. So I like to use a No GPU OU. I don't apply any GPOs to that particular OU and I can move computers that may be experiencing some problems and I'm suspicious that it's a GPO, I can stick them in that OU temporarily to see if that is the problem. Study the best practices for GPOs. There's lots of resources on best practices. There's a lot of great admins who share great ideas out there on the internet and they are awesome and you can learn a lot from that. Make sure you have some mechanism for documenting your group policies. Some people use spreadsheets, some use third party, some use the ugly nasty features built into group policy management console. Back up your GPOs. The most important thing I can give anyone is keep things simple. Complexity is your enemy. Simplicity is your best friend. One last thing that you can add to your Active Directory is an OU called Test GPOs. Just like we have a OU for no GPOs, I have an OU that I use for testing out GPOs. I can throw a lab computer in there or into that OU and then throw GPUs on it that I'm testing to see how they perform. We have in no way even touched the subject of GPOs, but you have some foundation in this first video to get you started.